Um, but yeah, I guess thank you everybody for coming to my talk. Um, this session will be a little bit longer than you're probably accustomed to. This is going to be like an hour session. I'm going to try to talk for an hour, and then we've got another 10 minutes for questions. So hopefully I don't lose you guys in the second half. But yeah, so uh, thanks for coming. Um, if you haven't guessed already, I'm going to be talking about GenOps, supporting generative AI workloads with open source tooling and Kubeflow. Um, of course, I am, my name is Farshad Khotsian. I'm a lead consultant at Source Group. Uh, and what we do at Source Group is we help large enterprise move their workloads to the cloud. Everything from app modernization, app migrations, to building out landing zones. I specifically specialize in building out uh, large data platforms and ML platforms in the cloud. Um, with the more recent explosion of generative AI, I'm also finding myself building generative AI solutions in the cloud. So I kind of want to share that knowledge, some of the learnings that me and my team have, have learned over the course of a year with you guys. So hopefully you'll, you'll get some good content out of this. Um, and yeah, the other thing I would like to mention is Source Group we recently got acquired by Amdocs, our parent company. So that's why you'll see uh, we are now an Amdocs company. But yeah, I guess a um, lot to cover. So we'll get started if that's OK with everyone. So yeah, first thing I want to mention, uh, you guys are probably wondering, for, for those who weren't in Nick's talk yesterday on what is Kubeflow, um, I'll kind of explain what Kubeflow actually is. So yeah, so Kubeflow first started out as uh, in Google. Google created Kubeflow. It was their ML offering for quite some time before they decided to open source it in 2018, thankfully, so that we all get to play with Kubeflow. And Kubeflow is an ML ops platform that runs entirely on Kubernetes. Um, and it services the whole ML lifecycle, everything from model development to model training, model serving, model monitoring, and, and all the stuff, what have you. And, and you can use it as a platform in its entirety, or you can also use specific components of Kubeflow like, and switch and swap out the ones you want to use. Um, and then the other cool thing about Kubeflow, because it's open sourced, it lends itself really nicely to working with other open source solutions like Keycloak, which we're using for a single sign-on, MLflow for model tracking, Spark on Kubernetes, et cetera. You'll see me demo some of this stuff uh, in the presentation. Um, and as well, other cool thing is Kubeflow, as of July, got accepted into the CNCF, or the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, and the Kubeflow team is working hard to, to get that set up as an incubating project. And as well, Kubeflow is very much in active development. Uh, the Kubeflow team, I was a part of some of the community calls, um, and they worked really hard to get Kubeflow 1.8 out the door as of November 1st. Uh, and a lot of cool new features. Uh, personally, my favorite new feature with Kubeflow 1.8 is the PVC viewer, which allows you to look into PVC volumes directly from the UI and transfer files to it. And PVC volumes are the st underlying storage that gets attached to your notebook or your model server. So yeah. And then um, one thing you guys are probably wondering, you know, what sets Kubeflow apart, and why would you know an organization or a person want to use Kubeflow instead of you know some of the cloud offerings like AWS SageMaker, GCP for Text AI, or Azure ML? Um, uh, I've kind of categorized these into five key factors, which I'll go into. Um, the first one, of course, is cost savings. Because Kubeflow is open source, you're not paying for any licensing fees using Kubeflow. Um, you're not, you know, paying like you're not getting charges tacked on just because it's an ML instance in the cloud. You're really just playing for the underlying compute and the storage uh, that you're using. So it's it's hard to compete with that on cost. The next thing is portability. Um, for a lot of large enterprises that we work with, you know, they don't want to be pigeonholed or, or, or locked into a single cloud, or they have mandates or regulatory requirements to be in multiple clouds. Um, and, and what Kubeflow allows you to do is, is run on like pretty much anywhere, any cloud, whether it's AWS, GCP, Azure, even on-prem. So long as you have a Kubernetes cluster, uh, you can run Kubeflow. And, and what I like to say is when you run Kubeflow, you know, the same team that supports uh, you know, Kubeflow on one cloud can also support Kubeflow on another cloud. You kind of solve for one cloud, and you almost solve for, for all the other ones. The next thing about Kubeflow, another benefit, is usability. Um, the UI you'll see in, in my demo is highly customizable. Um, you can integrate it with other uh, open source solutions. So, so your data science users or the users of your platform don't actually have to go to like another website to access another tool. They don't have to go to the cloud console and learn how to navigate the cloud console. You'll see the Kubeflow UI is very easy to understand, and everything is all contained within uh, the Kubeflow UI. So definitely a, a really big plus. 
Um, as well, upgradability. Of course, Kubeflow being open source, you have access to the code base. So what that means is that you can customize and add the features that your data science team or your organization uh, wants. You don't have to wait for the vendor or the cloud provider's roadmap to implement a feature that you want. Um, and then hopefully, you know, you add these cool new features, you can also contribute back to the open source community and, and back to the Kubeflow code base. Uh, and then lastly, familiarity. So if, if we, so a lot of the organizations we work with, they, they have a mature Kubernetes platform engineering team. So if, if you're used to running Kubernetes or you're already running Kubernetes workloads in your organization or in your team, you'll feel right at home with running uh, Kubeflow on Kubernetes. So yeah, if you're asking yourself what that kind of looks like, I have like a diagram. Let me just zoom in maybe so you guys can see it a little bit more. Ooh, maybe not. There we go. Anyways, um, but yeah, so at the heart of this, the, this is kind of a logical diagram of all the different components that we have in our uh, internal Kubeflow cluster that we're running. But basically, at the center, you have Kubeflow. Um, let me see if this laser pointer actually works. There we go. Um, so one thing I really love about Kubeflow is their notebook environment. Uh, not only can you run Jupyter notebooks, which data scientists are accustomed to using, but you can also run Visual Code Server directly in the Kubeflow platform on Kubernetes. You can run RStudio. You can even, you know, for those data scientists who want to use the Spark shell or whatever, you have access to the terminal and you can run your code directly on Kubeflow. Uh, some other important things that come with Kubeflow, you have the model serving piece, which is KServe. KServe is great for scaling out uh, models uh, serving models at scale, and then you have Catib, which is the auto ML uh, for hyperparameter tuning that comes out of the box with Kubeflow as well. We've also, I guess I should say, Kubeflow pipelines for ML orchestration. And then we've also added other open source projects into our platform. So you can see we have ML Flow for model tracking, Label Studio for uh, annotation. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why we're using Label Studio for generative AI workloads. It's, it's really cool. Um, yeah, Feast for Feature Store, and then, of course, Spark on Kubernetes. I, I love Spark on Kubernetes. As of the newer versions of Spark, um, it natively supports running on Kubernetes, so that's also important uh, in your ML lifecycle. Um, and then initially, I should probably say, uh, for Kubernetes GitOps, you know, the, the standard tools you're used to using, like Argo CD for managing YAML manifest files, again, key cloak for authentication, and also Terraform for deploying all the infrastructure. These are all things you, you can use and your team might already be familiar with. But yeah, so um, because this is supposed to be like a workshop, I I'm going to kind of walk you guys through uh, how to install Kubeflow. Of course, you guys can do it if you have a recently modern laptop. You, you could go ahead and install it or, or do it a little bit afterwards. Um, but what, what you will need to, to run Kubeflow locally is you'll need a uh, Kubernetes installation locally. So you can use anything from Docker Desktop with K3D. You can use Minikube. Uh, my preferable tool of choice is Rancher Desktop, just because Docker kind of updated their licensing. So if you're working in a large organization, you have to kind of pay licensing fees. Rancher Desktop is still open source, completely free. So um, if you want, or it doesn't have to be today, but you can definitely go to the Rancher Desktop website. Um, I see most of you guys might be using Mac, but it, it supports Mac, Windows, and Linux. Uh, you just download the executable install Docker, uh, sorry, Rancher Desktop, and then you'll have a Kubernetes cluster running locally on your laptop. Um, and then I'm going to show you now uh, how do you actually install Kubeflow. So yeah, there's a couple ways to install Kubeflow. Of course, the first one being is using a package distribution. Um, so let me actually just go to the Kubeflow install page and show you guys. Yeah, so here's the install page uh, for the Kubeflow documentation. And as you can see, you have multiple distributions of Kubeflow. Uh, all the major cloud providers, AWS, Azure, Google, they all have uh, their own Kubeflow distribution as well. Some other notable ones are Charmed Kubeflow by Canonical and also Deploy KF. Deploy KF is, is definitely a cool one to check out. Um, and as you can see, every single uh, distribution, you go to their website and they have their own you know, documentation for getting it up and running in a specific cloud provider or using something, for example, deploy KF um, to get this stuff installed. Um, the other thing you'll, you'll note is that most of the distributions are already running the latest version of Kubeflow 1.8, or they're in the process of working really hard to get their distribution updated to support the newer version of 1.8. Of course, there's some legacy distributions which are no longer being maintained, so they've kind of got demoted to the bottom of the list. Um, but yeah, that's, that's one way you can install Kubeflow. Um, of course, that's not maybe what I recommend initially if you're running uh, Kubeflow locally. What I actually recommend is installing Kubeflow via the manifest files. 
So of course, um, this might seem like a little bit more of an advanced uh, way of installing Kubeflow, but as you'll see in, in the next slide, it's actually fairly easy. Um, and the main reason why I recommend you install Kubeflow via the manifest files is that you can actually go in and install every single component one by one and get yourself more familiar with you know, what components, what deployments make up Kubeflow, and also where does everything live? What namespace do the various components live in? So um, here you go. I've pre-recorded this only because uh, if I go in, I could install it myself, but I will probably run over time. So I just kind of, this forces me to talk really quickly. <laughs> but yeah, so once you have Rancher Desktop installed, you'll go to the Kubeflow manifest page. Actually, let me show you that, what that looks like. So yeah, so the, Kubeflow has a bunch of repositories. The manifest repository actually lives in Kubeflow slash manifest, and it's maintained by the Kubeflow manifest working group. And basically what the manifest files are, they're a collection of YAML files. Under the hood, Kubeflow uses Customize to install all its components. If you're not familiar with Customize, think of it kind of like Helm. It's like Helm, but kind of different compared to Helm. But you don't really need to know uh, initially how Customize works to be able to get this stuff installed. Um, if you go down to the repo instructions, you'll see th these are all the various components of Kubeflow. Um, and then as well, you'll actually have the install instructions. So you can see here, there is a one-liner command that you can just copy paste if you're running something like uh, Git Bash or you have Linux. And what this will do is it will loop through all the components of Kubeflow, install them one by one, and then it'll keep retrying until it sees all the components are up and running. Um, of course, I don't recommend that because sometimes you run into issues with this and you don't really know what you're installing. So I'm gonna be walking through how to install each component. So yeah, let me play this video and then I'll try to talk through this video. Um, so yeah, so we went to the Kubeflow manifest uh, page. First thing you wanna do is select the version of Kubeflow you wanna install. So if you go to the latest branch, which is version 1.8, you can also go to the release page and download 1.8 that way, but you clone this repo. Um, and then you'll see here, I'm just gonna skip ahead because I already talked about some of the stuff. Yeah, so the first thing we're gonna install, the first component of Kubeflow is uh, Cert Manager. So Cert Manager is used for automating the creation of certificates and as well renewal of certificates. So what we've done is we've actually linked Cert Manager with Let's Encrypt. So we're able to generate certificates for HTTPS uh, totally free. But yeah, so I, I ran uh, to look at all the pods. Currently we only have the Kubeflow system pods, nothing else installed. So there you go, I copied and pasted the Cert Manager command um, and then you'll see all the Cert Manager uh, components installed. Don't worry about that error that you'll, you'll see over here. It says in the documentation, just means Cert Manager's not ready yet. But if I check the Cert Manager namespace over here, you can see um, you've got the three pods for Cert Manager installed. Next thing we're gonna install is Istio. So Istio is, is used for service mesh and for uh, like routing traffic. You know, you go to a specific URL, it sends you to a central dashboard or it sends you to you know, the notebook page via uh, virtual services. So, and that lives in the Istio system namespace. So you'll see there, we've got the Istio daemon and then Istio ingress gateway, which is really important. We'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, and then we're gonna install the auth service. This is used to connect to like an OIDC provider and it's used in conjunction with, with Dext, which is the next thing that gets installed. Um, and Dex is used for authentication. And, and uh, is, the authentication server lives with Istio system, but Dex lives in its own namespace called auth. Now the rest of the components, I'm not gonna actually like check every single pod. I'm just gonna run through them and, and talk about them. So first thing we're gonna install is Knative, uh, Knative serving and Knative eventing, which is kind of the underlying really important for KServe. Um, and then we're gonna install the Kubeflow namespace. All the, most of the components of Kubeflow live in the Kubeflow namespace. So I've just run that, um, installed the Kubeflow RBAC roles, and then we're gonna install the Istio resources, which is like the Kubeflow gateway, which is pretty important, uh, and as well, Kubeflow pipeline. So this is all you're doing. You're kind of going through, copying and pasting, and just getting all the components installed. It's, it's fairly easy and straightforward. We're installing KServe now, which is used for model, model serving at scale. We're installing Katib, which again is the hyperparameter tuning uh, auto, auto ML feature. Of course, you got the central dashboard, which is what you'll see when you connect through the UI, and the admissions webhook, which is basically kind of uh, tells what users can access which parts of Kubeflow. We've got the notebooks and the Jupyter Web App front end interface you're installing, the new PVC viewer that I mentioned, and as well the profiles and, and Kubeflow access management, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Web apps, and then if you're familiar with TensorFlow or used TensorFlow before, we're also installing TensorBoard. Um, which is pretty cool. Uh, you've got the training operator, which is getting installed right now. This training operator is used for you know, training at scale. 
Um, and then as well, the last thing is the user namespace. So every team or user gets their own like namespace or workspace, which I'll, I'll show later. And then it also installs uh, or sets up a default user. Um, of course, you can go and change this. The last thing I'm doing here is I'm just running a command to kind of check all the namespaces, make sure all the pods are running. So you can see here most of the you know, initial components that I installed are already running. Uh, and then we're just waiting for some of the Kubeflow uh, stuff in the Kubeflow namespace to, to fully initialize. One thing I should caution you is if you're going through this install for the first time, you might see in the Kubeflow namespace there'll be a lot of different pods that actually fail to deploy. So you'll see them kind of in an error image pull or you know, uh, image back pull failed. And what basically that means, you know, don't fret. What that really means is because you're downloading so many different container images, most of these containers are actually coming from something like a GCR. And, and what GCR is doing is it's rate limiting you. It's, it's realizing that like you're, you're requesting like 30 different images, trying to install them, and it's going to actually like block you for a short amount of time. But if you just wait like two to five minutes, the ones that are in failed state will just retry and eventually they'll be able to pull the image they need and everything will be up and running. So yeah, it's fairly simple. I mean, there's a lot of uh, components behind the scenes, but as you use Kubeflow more, you'll get more and more familiar with all the different components. And then the other reason why I actually like um, Rancher Desktop, I'll, I'll kind of show you here. So, so the next thing you need to do, once you installed all the components, you need to actually expose the Istio ingress gateway, um, which lives in the Istio system namespace, on port 8080 um, to your local system so that you can access it. And basically, the Istio ingress gateway, let me just zoom in here. Um, the Istio ingress gateway is kind of like your main entry point into the cluster. So when you connect to a Kubeflow URL, it first hits the Istio uh, ingress gateway, and then it kind of decides, OK, uh, you need to go to the central dashboard. I'm going to send you there. Then it's going to go to Dex, and Dex is going to be like, OK, you need to authenticate. Goes to the auth service, comes back, and then you're in. And then if you're going to like a notebook URL, it knows to send you to the notebook service. So, so that's fairly important. But of course, you know, if you've worked with Kubernetes before, you can run this command to do a port forwarding on port 8080. Uh, you have to kind of keep the terminal running. There's other options. But what I like about um, Rancher Desktop is they actually have port forwarding built into the uh, UI. So I'm just going to play this. But yeah, so you can see this is like the Rancher Desktop once you have it up and running. If you go into port forwarding, you just need to find the, oh, wait, uh, the Istio Ingress Gateway. Make sure you're also uh, port forwarding the HTTP service, just because by default, uh, it doesn't run on HTTPS on HTTP. But yeah, you just port forward it to 8080, and then you can go into localhost, uh, and then there you go. By default, you're just using the vanilla DEX interface. You're logging in with user at example.com. Um, and then the password is 1234, 1234. Of course, make sure you change that or switch to a different auth provider. <laughs> um, and then here, you're in the, the Kubeflow uh, UI. So here you can see you've got notebooks, you've got pipelines, uh, you've got like uh, endpoints for model serving, and then you can even go in, start creating your Jupyter notebook, you know, playing around with generative models and, and, and what have you. So yeah, it's a pretty cool interface. This is what you get out of the box with Kubeflow. Um, I'm going to show you now what we actually have uh, done with Kubeflow or how we've customized it. Um, here, I'll just show you like a splash screen of all the other really cool things with Kubeflow. You've got tensor boards. This is the AutoML experimentation. You're serving models, some monitoring there. One thing I do want to highlight in the middle, which I won't have time to talk about, but is a pretty cool nifty tool, is actually Elyra AI. So Elyra AI is an open source extensions for Jupyter Lab that's centered around AI. Um, and, and it has cool things like you know, be, the ability to save code snippets or clone from repos. But the other cool thing that it has is this kind of uh, you, you're, the ability to create Kubeflow pipelines with low code or like no code. Basically, um, you have this pipeline editor where you can take all your you know, Python scripts or your Jupyter notebook, drag it onto the pipeline editor, and then connect the different steps. Uh, so you can see here, I've created a pipeline where I'm loading data, then I am doing some data cleansing, and then I am doing a time series and, and doing some other analytics. But yeah, definitely something worth uh, checking out. Um, the only thing is it doesn't support Kubeflow Pipelines v2. It's still on Kubeflow Pipelines v1, which is kind of old, but definitely worth checking out, uh, Elira, especially for those data science teams who don't really want to learn Kubeflow Pipelines. But yeah, let me jump back and show you our uh, Kubeflow implementation. 
So if I go to this URL, um, right off the bat, you'll see something quite different. Um, because we're using KeyCloak uh, for authentication, it, it, it allows you to kind of style the login page however you like. So for any organization, they can have their logo up there. We have our, of course, source logo with the source branding and colors. The other cool thing is you don't just have to log in with like username and password. We have set up single sign-on. So all I have to do here is click single sign-on. And then, of course, granted access, and I'm into the Kubeflow. Um, so this is great for large organizations. It's very easy to onboard users when you can just hook into the existing SSO. And then the other thing you'll notice is there's actually a lot more options in our implementation of Kubeflow. Um, it's not just you know the stuff you get out of the box. Uh, I can probably zoom in a little bit. Um, but yeah, so not only do we have the default things that come with Kubeflow, like I mentioned, we're integrating with tools like MLflow. And as you can see here, we actually have MLflow directly in the Kubeflow UI. So data scientists don't need to like know what the MLflow URL is or go to a different page. Um, as well, Feast. Feast is used for feature, feature stores. Of course, these two are mainly like ML related, not really for generative AI. But you know, we have that on our platform. Um, and then here's Label Studio. So Label Studio is actually pretty cool as well. It's another open source, uh, I guess, project. Um, it does have a commercial offering, but the open source side of things works just as fine. And the reason why I like Label Studio for annotating data is you know, not only does it cater to you know, normal ML works, uh, workloads, like for example, it, it supports templates for computer vision, natural language processing, speech and audio. The other cool thing is they have actually created templates specific to um, generative AI. And I'll show you later on in my demo what we're actually using or how we're using Label Studio um, in our generative AI workflow. But yeah, definitely a cool project to check out. Um, and then as well, the other thing I wanted to highlight is here we have like a bunch of notebooks that our users are using, but there's also this thing called workspaces, which I mentioned previously. So for example, right now we have two workspaces. So imagine like this workspace is like the data science team's workspace, and then this one is the finance team's workspace. So, so each team has their own space, and if you switch, uh, of course I'm the owner of both workspaces, but if you switch, you can clearly see like it's totally different workloads. So users in one, one team or one workspace don't have access to the notebooks from the other team. Um, and as well, if I go to models right now, you know, the source sandbox namespace or workspace doesn't have any models deployed. But if I switch over to the Kubeflow Playground, you can see we have a generative AI T5 model, which I'm going to demo. And then we're also playing around with VLLM. So we have a VLLM server also running on KServe. Um, and then lastly, like I mentioned with the functionality of uh, Kubeflow, not only are you using Jupyter Notebooks, but just for an example here, I'm going to start up a, uh, our, what is this, uh, VS Code server. And again, you also have, like I mentioned, our studio if you really wanted. Um, just give it a minute, it'll spin up. And I'm doing this for you, Nick, because you wanted to see what <laughs> VS Code server looks like. It actually spins up really quickly. Um, it's basically requesting some compute and memory resources from the Kubernetes cluster. And then once it spins up, uh, you're going to see we have a, there you go. This is, you're familiar with, this is actually VS Code running. So the data scientists, some of the data scientists we work with, they find that if they're trying to run stuff on VS Code directly on their laptop, they might not have that much resources, but you can use the full power of Kubernetes um, and run VS Code. So that's pretty cool too. Uh, yeah, so let's go back to our slide. I wish I could talk more about some of the components of Kubeflow, but... I don't know if I have time. Uh, let's go back. Uh, this. Sorry, I totally forgot to set my timer. <laughs> okay, so you guys might be wondering what does the architecture or the underlying architecture of Kubeflow look like? Um, for our internal Kubeflow platform, we decided to deploy it on uh, GCP or Google Cloud. So uh, I'll zoom in here for a bit, but this is what the architecture actually looks like. So at first glance, it might look a little bit complicated, um, but let me just zoom in. It, it's not really that complicated. Um, the heart of the whole infrastructure is actually this Kubernetes cluster. So like you, I showed before, all the components of Kubeflow uh, kind of live inside the Kubernetes cluster. Um, the other thing you'll note is it's actually in a private cluster. So one thing I caution with, with trying to use the existing distributions of Kubeflow, a lot of them are set up to actually deploy a public cluster. And, and Kubeflow is something you really don't want to make publicly available. So that's why I, we chose to deploy via the manifest files, because this way we can actually deploy a private cluster and then deploy all the components directly on that private cluster. So it's only accessible by our organization. 
Um, and then the way we get into the cluster, of course, is we have a public VPC um, that's running a VPN server, and then we have our users using a VPN client to direct, connect directly to the uh, Kubeflow cluster. And, and of course, we're using extra security stuff like you know, client whitelists and, and whatnot, so only our users can connect to the cluster. Um, and again, in our internal implementation, we're just using a WireGuard, which is an open source free VPN solution. It's really cool. But in most customers that we work with, they already have an existing like client VPN, so we just hook directly into that. Um, and then, of course, um, all the other, we do leverage some managed services from uh, the cloud provider. So for example, for cloud, for storage, uh, for container registry, and also for database, we're using uh, Google Cloud Storage, Google Container Registry, or GCR, and then, of course, Cloud SQL. Um, and then just for the operation side of things, you can use you know, your, your pipeline tool of choice. We're using Bitbucket, but of course, you use whatever the client is using. Um, and then we're, again, we're using things like Terraform to deploy all this infrastructure. So again, it's, it's, and it's static. So once you're deploying get all this stuff set up, you're not really changing any of the infrastructure. At most, the thing you're doing is maybe adding more node pools with different GPU or instance types and just making your cluster larger and larger. But there really isn't anything else you need to, to set up for this to work. Um, okay, so uh, the Kubeflow side of things over now. Now we're going to switch gears into generative GenOps, I guess. Uh, and some of you might be wondering what is GenOps, um, and you wouldn't be remiss to kind of not really he hear that term before. Uh, I did a Google search like last week, yesterday, and even this morning, and you'll see not a lot of people are using the term GenOps, um, but I'll explain it here. So basically, GenOps is the practice that aims to develop, to make developing and maintaining production generative AI models uh, much more efficient and, and seamless. And it covers kind of all the types of generative models. So not just language models, but also image, uh, voice, multimodal. Um, and similar to what I explained with, with MLOps, it also covers like the entire spectrum of generative AI. So not just model development, model training, but there's fine tuning, gen AI tooling like agents and chains. Um, you've got model serving and then scaling you know, on GPU hardware, prompt management, human feedback, uh, and then some of the more important things like uh, data privacy and ethics and security guardrails. So yeah, you guys might be wondering, well, isn't that just LLM ops? <laughs> and it's true that LLM ops is kind of the most popular term nowadays for referring to this kind of things. Um, me and a few others uh, kind of feel LLM ops doesn't go far enough because like with the switch to more like uh, smaller generative models and also the introduction of ML uh, multimodal with things like uh, Gemini, um, and, and more domain-specific models, and then the incorporation of helper models, you'll see that like not everything is an LLM. You're going to see very quickly in the next few months, probably, a lot more models supporting image generation, voice generation, and what have you. So definitely, I encourage everybody to kind of switch to the new term, GenOps, and, and not just mention uh, LLM ops. The other thing I want to mention is, I kid you not, I read an article the other week, and in the same article, they mentioned Gen AI ops, LLM ops, and RAG ops. And like, honestly, Gen AI Ops doesn't roll off the tongue. And please don't use Reg Ops. It just sounds very weird. <laughs> I don't know where they're going with all these terms. Um, and then, of course, you can't have a Gen AI talk without talking about retrieval augmented generation. I'm sorry to bring this up, but the reason why I'm bringing this up is in my demo, I'll show you a, a reg setup. So of course, we have to talk about retrieval augmented generation. Um, and of course, most of you know this is referred to as RAG. In older research papers, this was called Retrieval Augmented in Context Learning. But you know that acronym probably doesn't sound too good, so we have RAG. But basically, RAG is, is kind of like the AI architecture where you're using or retrieving facts from an external knowledge store. And then you're feeding that into the model's context and asking it to answer question. Um, and it, it, we find it, it gives you more accurate and more contextually relevant information. Um, it also allows you to use a lot smaller models to get you know, just as good answers as a large general foundation model. Um, and of course, I have a diagram here. You've probably seen many diagrams of, of RAG. Um, this one I find is fairly simple and it illustrates it pretty well. Um, so yeah, so user asks a question. Um, then you go to some kind of like pipeline agent, which will uh, take that question, vectorize it, go into a, a vector database and retrieve like you know the top five most relevant chunks or uh, information. And then that'll feed that into the model and then say, you know, based on the context that I've given you, please answer this user's question. 
And, and actually, I'll maybe give an analogy just for some of the people who might not be quite clear on this thing. Uh, what I like to say is, like, imagine you're, you're, you're writing an exam um, on a topic you've never really seen before. You know, you're not going to really have a good time. And this is what foundation models generally have to do. For example, if I'm using a large foundation model and I'm asking it about specific questions on Kubeflow, um, more than likely, you know, that foundation model might not know or have access to the Kubeflow documentation, so it might not really give the greatest answers. Um, it might just completely refuse to answer your question, or even worse, it might just like hallucinate and give you the wrong answer. So what I liken RAG to is like imagine writing an exam with an open book test. So if you're writing that same exam, but you have a book of like all the Kubeflow documentation and stuff like that, you can much more easily, you know, answer the question. So yeah. And again, I love architecture diagrams, so I'm going to give you the actual architecture diagram we have for, for the demo that I'll be showing you. Um, here we go. Hopefully you guys can see that. Um, but what I've done is I've kind of broken this out into three different, um, I guess, workflows or phases which, to help you understand. Of course, the first one being the data loading phase. Yeah, sorry. Let me zoom in here. There we go. Hopefully that. So the first thing you want to do, obviously, is take your, you know, your corpus of documents or your internal knowledge store, um, and then it can be in any format. You can have PDFs, HTML, text, what have you. But what you'll do is initially you'll probably want to do some ETL and kind of clean up the data. You might also want to add relevant metadata before you put it into your vector DB. Um, but once you get all your data together, you're going to use an embeddings model. Um, at the time when we created this, BGE was kind of the top embeddings model on Hugging Face, so that's what we're using. Um, and then we're vectorizing all the data and putting it into a vector data store. Um, again, this was fairly, I guess, antiquated by Gen AI standards. We were using ChromaDB because that was kind of the hip new uh, vector DB for that time. But of course, you can use, you know, just in this conference alone, I, I've learned about, you know, Cassandra using vector DBs. You've got PG vector and, and Postgres ML, um, and you can run, you know, anything from Pinecone, Milvis, what, what have you. Um, and then the other thing I want to mention is when you're vectorizing documents and putting it into vector data store, you're not just you know, turning the data into numbers and throwing it into the vector data store. What you're doing is that embeddings model is very important. It's adding like a whole bunch of dimensionality to the documents or the text or tokens. Um, and it's also kind of adding semantic meaning. Uh, so that's how it, it works there. But I won't go too much into that. Um, yeah, so you've got, of course, the app front end. So what we're using for our app front end is, uh, I guess, open source library called Streamlit. Um, and Streamlit's pretty awesome. It, you can see it at streamlit.io. But it, it lends itself really well to building out rich you know, data web apps uh, using Python. So definitely something to check out. Of course, there's alternatives like Gradio, but I really like Streamlit. Um, and then, yeah, and then we have the model service, which you can see here is running on KServe, and it can scale out to n number of like pods, depending on how much traffic that, that you get. So yeah, so now I'm going to hopefully uh, give you guys some kind of learnings that we've, we've gone when we're running generative AI workloads on uh, Kubeflow. So here we go. Um, and I apologize, this might get a little bit technical, um, but yeah, I'll try to kind of illustrate this stuff with uh, examples as well. Uh, so the first learning that we want to talk about is GPU time sharing uh, to increase GPU utilization and cost savings. So of course, if you're working with generative AI models, you're more than likely using GPUs, uh, especially on the model serving side and also model development. Um, and GPU time sharing, if you, there was a talk earlier today about GPU time sharing, time slicing, but I'll kind of explain it here. What GPU time sharing is it allows multiple pods to utilize a single GPU. So uh, that is very beneficial when you're working with generative AI models. The other thing I should note is that you can't use more VRAM than what the GPU is actually capable of. If your GPU has 40 gigs of VRAM, you have to make sure that all the workloads that are running on that GPU don't exceed that memory or you'll get out of memory errors. Um, and that's not typically the best thing when you're running applications where you don't know the memory requirements. But specifically for LLMs and like working with LLMs inside a notebook environment and exploring and you know doing prompt engineering, this lends itself really well to using GPU time sharing. And the reason for that is basically um, you almost always know the memory requirement of the model you're using. 
So for example, if you're using Llama 270B, you know that's going to take about 15 gigs of VRAM. If you're running it in 8-bit, it's like 9 gigs or even smaller if you're using 4-bit quantization. So if your team you know, plays nicely together, it lends itself really well to, to running multiple models on the same GPU. The other thing I should mention with time sharing that's pretty cool is if nobody, if, if a single user is using that GPU, that user gets access to 100% of the compute of that GPU. If you've got a second uh, user requesting like that GPU, um, then it kind of, you know, divides that evenly 50%, uh, 50%. And, and, and this is generally what, what works with data science workflow. You're, you're not 100% hitting the GPU all the time unless you're doing fine tuning or training, which of course I don't recommend GPU time sharing for. But um, when you're basically like working in a Jupyter Notebook environment, you're loading a model, and then you're kind of asking it a question, you're getting a response back, you're, you're looking at um, what the, if the response is very good, you might then decide to switch model or do, you know, change the prompt. So, you know, that way you're usually typically underutilizing a GPU. Um, and then lastly, I'll also mention MIG, which is multi-instance GPU. So I, I won't really go into detail, but there are a lot of cool videos on YouTube from NVIDIA, from Google, and other people specifically on GPU time sharing and multi-instance GPUs. But multi-instance GPUs is kind of a way of physically isolating the GPU or dividing it into different slices. And then each user has access to that specific slice. They can't use more than that specific slice, but it's also another way of, again, dividing very large GPUs so that you, know, you save on cost. Um, and of course, MIG is only uh, supported on the newer NVIDIA hardware. That's the A300, A100, and H200, and most likely the new H200 as well. Um, and then it's very easy to enable on most cloud providers. Here's an example of how we've done it on GCP. This is some Terraform code. All you really have to do here is just specify, I want GPU uh, sharing config. Um, the strategy I'm using is time sharing. And then I want maximum four pods per GPU. And then when you go to deploy your workload, obviously you add similar annotation on your workloads to say use time sharing. It's really simple to do. Um, and this has to be done though on node creation time, node pool creation time, or cluster creation time but definitely something worth checking out if you're working with generative AI models. What are we on time? We're still good. Okay, so the next one I'm gonna kind of talk about is using read-only many persistent volumes uh, for rapid scaling. So we all know generative AI models can be very large. Um, you have something like, in our demo, we're using Flan T5, 248 million. It's a small model by today's standards. But then you have something like Llama 7B, which is 15 gigabytes. You have Llama 13B, which is 40 gigabytes. And that's not even the largest you know, generative AI Llama model. Um, basically, anytime if you're like deploying a model server on KServe, every time a pod spins up, it has to actually download the model files either from Hugging Face or from like S3 or GCS uh, before it can actually start serving requests. Um, and as you, you know, if you get a bunch of requests and you're scaling up to 10 pods, that can definitely add a lot of latency and a lot of like unneeded, unnecessary traffic. So what we've done on our cluster is basically we've created a, the default persistent volume, which is just like a, a disk, um, which is in, in default, it comes as a read write once. That means one disk can only be used by one pod and you can read write to the files. So what we do is we create a new persistent volume and then we download the model files onto that persistent volume. Uh, and pro tip, if you uh, aren't aware, you can actually use the git lfs clone command to clone uh, the model files for any Hugging Face repository. Because on the back end, a Hugging Face repository or a Hugging Face like model is really just a git repository. But yeah, so we download the model files onto that uh, persistent volume. And then the next thing we do is we create a read-only many volume. Uh, and we clone the previous volume that we created as a read-only many volume. The reason why we do this is because if you just create a read-only many volume, uh, it's going to be an empty volume, and it's read-only, so you can't actually add any files to it. So you have to always clone it from an existing volume. Um, and then I can kind of show you this is just the YAML file um, for creating that persistent volume. So now that you have this read-only many volume, the next thing you can do is um, when you're deploying your case serve sort of model inference service, again, it's a, it's a YAML file. Um, you basically specify this is the persistent volume with your model file, and then this is the local folder where you want to mount it. Um, now that you, when you do that, every time you scale up to more than X number of pods, every single pod, all they have to do is just attach that existing volume instead of like downloading the volume every single time. And then this leads to rapid scaling up of, of pods when you're serving. I'm sure a lot of the uh, you know, big AI companies are probably already doing this. Nobody's really talked about it, but definitely something to, to look into. 
So yeah, so the next uh, gen ops uh, learning that I want to talk about is actually saving model responses for human feedback. So if you aren't familiar with some human feedback techniques, there is reinforcement learning with human feedback, which is RLHF, and then DPO, which is direct preference optimization. Uh, I can't really go into too much detail on what these two are, but basically with reinforcement learning, you're creating a rewards model um, that's trained on preference data that you want, like specific answers uh, that you want. Um, and then that reward model gets kind of put into the training lifecycle of the model, and then the model is trying to optimize for the largest reward. Um, it's kind of complicated. It's also um, very complex. So I, I wouldn't recommend you use RLHF. I definitely recommend you use direct preference optimization. And what DPO does is basically um, get a bunch of data, like you're, you're scoring the data or the responses that the model is giving as like good response versus bad response, and then you optimize inside the specific LLM um, the, the preference or the way you want your model to answer. So yeah, so I highly recommend when you are like uh, building out your model front end, make sure you're saving um, all the model responses to an annotation tool, like for example, uh, Label Studio, which I'll show. Um, Label Studio is a great tool to save annotation. Uh, and then you can go in after the fact and score it as like, this, these are good responses, these are bad responses. Um, of course, I also recommend you probably do that from the end user perspective. So in your web UI, you'll see some of the chat interfaces will actually like have a thumbs up or thumbs down, like this was a good response, that was a bad response. Um, and you let the user do that so that it saves you from having to annotate that stuff after the fact. We haven't done that in our demo, but definitely cool. Um, and then if you take anything away from this slide, I highly recommend you use DPO or direct preference optimization. It's a lot simpler. It's computationally much cheaper and more stable. And it's been shown to provide better or at least similar results to RLHF. There's like a reason why the newer models like Zephyr or even the new Mixtro model, they all use DPO. Um, and if you want to learn more about DPO, uh, definitely check out Chris Manning on YouTube. Uh, he has a talk where he talks, I believe it's his team from Stanford that published a paper on DPO, and he'll kind of go through the whole math behind it, the Bradley Terry model, all that kind of cool stuff. Now, uh, we're almost done here. Um, but yeah, so this, I'm going to show you, like, so what does that look like? How can we take our existing architecture and add that whole human feedback loop to our uh, Architecture. So here we go. This is this is what we've done basically. So if I can zoom in, maybe Ooh, uh, there we go. So yeah. So what we've done is as we, you know, as we're we're asking questions to the model and we're saving the responses, we're also saving those responses directly to Label Studio. Once we get enough responses, like let's say your model's been running for like three months, you've got a whole bunch of responses, then you can take all those responses, rank them, and then use that in your RLHF or DPO pipeline. The other thing I should mention is you generally have to have a lot of data for DPO to be effective. So the other thing you actually can do, or the low-hanging fruit, which I recommend, is, for example, if we go back to the Kubeflow example, you're asking your model questions about Kubeflow, and you're finding that like the users are asking about KServe, but your model is not very good at answering questions about KServe. That doesn't necessarily mean you got to go through the whole like retraining or fine-tuning of the model. More, nine times out of 10, it's probably because you don't actually have enough documentation about KServe in your vector DB. So what you can do is just add more documentation or the missing information into your vector DB. Uh, and then you'll very quickly see that your model's a lot better at answering those kinds of questions. Uh, the other thing I would be remiss to mention is in our model service, we're actually using Langchain to kind of orchestrate everything. Of course, you can use Lama Index. Basically, when a user asks a question, it's actually going to Langchain first in the model server. Um, then Langchain is doing that similarity search to kind of find the most relevant documentation. Then it feeds it into the model. The model gives a response. And of course, you can run a model on CPU, which I'm doing in this demo, or you can use a larger model like Lama 2, um, what have you. But yeah, I think finally we're going to get to the demo. Thank you guys for bearing with me. Uh, let's, let's show you what actually it looks like. Um, so here we go. We've got our, our simple interface that we've built on Streamlit. Um, what you can see here um, is we have a set of collections. So uh, something else I didn't mention, in vector databases, you have a concept of a collection. So you can have different sets of documents um, as their own collection. So you can ask model you know, different information. Um, because I just came from reInvent, we're going to be asking it specifically on questions from AWS FAQs. So what we did is we took a whole bunch of the online AWS FAQs, which are made available in PDFs, throw that into our vector DB so that now we can ask questions specifically about AWS. 
But we also have other collections like you know, financial minutes and, and what have you. Um, the other thing I should mention is the model we're actually using is a very fairly small model. We're using the FLAN T5. This is an instruction fine-tuned FLAN T5 with 248 million parameters, which means like the model size is really 900 and something megabytes. Um, and it's great for running on CPU. Uh, that's the only reason we're using this model is because you know, we want to save on costs. I don't want my company to get a really big bill. Um, so yeah, so I will now ask it a question. I'm just going to minimize this. So I'm going to ask it specifically on AWS. Uh, what is Amazon Bedrock? So yeah, so if you weren't at reInvent a couple weeks ago, um, you'll find uh, what Amazon Bedrock is basically the generative AI service that AWS is, is now offering. And hopefully it shouldn't take too long. There we go. Our model has answered the question. So basically, Amazon Bedrock is a fully managed service that offers leading foundation models as a simple API and what have you. So like, the, the cool thing about this is we're using a model that's fairly old now, Flan T5. If you were to ask Flan T5 this question uh, without doing a reg implementation, it would probably not be a very good time. Um, and then let me just ask it another question. What... Oh, wait. Can... You tell me some of the names of the foundation models you can use with Amazon Bedrock. Just to show that the model is like, you know, keeping the conversation, the memory, and the context, hopefully the model gives us a good answer. And this is not really about accuracy, this is just about, you know, uh, kind of our implementation. There you go. So Bedrock gives you access to Claude, now Claude 2. Of course, a AI21 Labs, Jurassic Model, Civil AI. You even got Llama 2 in there. Um, but yeah, so of course, you know, this is a very simple demo. Let me actually show you guys what, what it's actually doing under the hood. And this is another tip I, I would probably recommend to you guys. When you're building out an application, especially in development, not in production, you, you might want to build a, a debug interface directly into your application. So we have this super secret debug mode uh, that we have in our application. Now when I turn this on and I do the same thing, um, let me ask it a question. What is Amazon EKS? And I'm just going to minimize this. Um, so yeah, so there you go. So now when I'm asking the model a question, because we have debug mode enabled, you can actually see what's going on under the hood. So this is the prompt that we've set up for our model. Uh, basically, we're saying, using the piece of context that we're providing you, answer the user's question. Um, the other key thing you should note is that we're also telling the model, if you don't know the answer, do not try to make up an answer. Just say you don't know. Uh, and we found in, in our testing that when you, you know, a simple sentence like this really helps with model hallucinations. I'll show you a bit later. I'm going to ask it a question that's like totally not related to AWS, and hopefully it doesn't make up an answer. Um, but yeah, so all we're doing is it, we have the model being served on KServe, and we're just sending it a JSON object that says this is our query, and then this is the collection that we want you to use. Um, and then where that's actually going, you'll see when the model returns a response, it's basically uh, returning the top four most relevant documents. So here you can see the first document that it actually found that's related to my question is right on the mark. It's basically what is uh, uh, Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service. Uh, and it's actually coming from, I believe, the you know, EKS PDF. Um, you can see here as well, you've kind of got like half of a sentence here and maybe another half of a sentence there. This is why chunking overlap is kind of important um, when you're building out your chunking strategy. But there you go. You can see it's returning basically all the documents that are relevant to um, uh, EKS. And then obviously it's giving you the final answer, which is Amazon EKS is an open source uh, container orchestration. Um, it's basically Kubernetes. Uh, managed Kubernetes on Amazon. Um, and then again, I was going to show you that example. So if I ask, like, what team won the NBA championship I spell that right, um, in 19, I don't know, 1982. So we're, we're hoping that the model does not actually try to make up an answer. And there you go. Because I added that specific sentence in my prompt, it's basically telling me the provided context does not uh, give me the information. Like, I can't answer your question. So again, Another cool thing that you might want to do. Um, and then let me jump over quickly to Label Studio just to show you that we are, in fact, saving these responses. Um, the other cool thing I should mention is uh, Langchain actually has a built-in module for Label Studio. So in your Langchain pipeline, you can save responses directly to Label Studio. So as you can see here, I'm just going to go to the most recent one, I guess. 
this was our MBA question, I guess. But this is the actual template that we're, we're, we're creating. It's basically what team. Uh, so basically, you have the question, you have the response. And then all you're doing is just scoring it as like, this is a good response, this is a bad response. So you can do this directly in your chat interface, or you can do it after the fact. I'm going to say this was actually a good response, I guess, because we didn't want the model to answer correctly. Uh, and then once you have a whole bunch of responses saved and ranked, uh, you can then go in and basically say, I want to export all of these. Uh, and then you export it as a CSV file. That's your data set that you use for the reinforcement learning, um, the DPO or what have you. So again, uh, and Label Studio is completely free to use. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, and I think we're kind of at the end of our presentation. Let's go back. There was a lot more other things I wanted to talk about, a lot more other learnings. Um, but of course, I, I've already talked for way too long. But some of the other cool things that we found is decoupling, decoupling and parameterizing your Gen AI components. You kind of saw that in my diagram. You know, every single component was kind of its own uh, pod or, or service. So this way, like, so you want to decouple the front end from the back end. So then that way you can swap out different models or different model services and the user, you know, doesn't really notice anything. Um, I would even go as far as taking the LangChain piece and also putting that in as its own thing so that if you make any changes to the model, you're not constantly rebuilding the container every time you go to deploy. Another cool thing KServe offers is notebook culling and KServe scale to zero. So that is, is really cool for resource management and freeing up resources. Notebook culling, you can basically set a timeout in the notebook. So if I go back to my VS Code server, if you remember, I had a VS Code server running. Uh, okay, maybe it hasn't timed out yet, but but you said an hour, you know, or 30 minutes, so that those data scientists who who don't really clean up after themselves, it'll automatically click, kick, kill the notebook if it's not being used. Um, and then scale to zero is pretty awesome. So when you deploy a model, you can set the minimum replicas as zero, so that if nobody is actually hitting the endpoint after five minutes or 30 minutes, it'll actually scale down that node for you and, and save on costs. Uh, and then another couple things, uh, I guess VLLM now is, is pretty popular, uh, so definitely try using that for speeding up GPU inference. And then if you're working with CPU, there's also something called Deep Sparse or Sparse ML, uh, which you can use to speed up model inference on CPU. That's something I'm kind of playing around with right now, but definitely something worth checking out. And finally, just to recap everything, you know, the open source community has a vibrant ecosystem of all the different tooling that you can use for ML ops and for gen ops. Uh, you can see here specifically for gen ops, of course, we have Kubeflow, KServe, LangChain, Lama Index, again, Label Studio and Streamlit and, and Chroma TB. Um, and then specifically for MLOps, definitely worth checking out MLflow if you're not already. Feast, Spark on Kubernetes. I love Spark on Kubernetes. I can do a whole talk just specifically on Spark on Kubernetes. And of course, Elira. So yeah, uh, thank you, everyone. I guess uh, we'll leave it up for questions, if anybody has any questions. I know this was a long talk, so <laughs> thank you guys for bearing with me. Um, <laughs> And then as well, if you want uh, to check out Kubeflow, you can also join the Kubeflow community Slack. Just scan that QR code. We're a pretty uh, cool community, pretty chill. Um, as well, you can connect with me on LinkedIn if you just want to ask more questions or anything like that. But yeah, thank you, everyone. Where are we at? I think we're good. Anybody? <laughs> Sorry, did you have a question over there? Yeah. Awesome. And I wondered if that was like available because I noticed that you went through like all of the different Kubeflow components in that notebook. Oh yes, that was actually from the Kubeflow uh, repository. So when you go to a Kubeflow manifest page, um, which again, if you go to Kubeflow slash manifest, um, it actually has basically install instructions and then all the different components of Kubeflow. Is that the one you were talking about? Yeah, and then, and then you're right. If you scroll down a little bit further, you have all the instructions of like how to install the different components one by one. Um, so yeah, you totally do that. Uh, yes? Yes.
Yeah, so I don't think it, specifically the cloud providers support using both because, like, as you can see, if I go back to my um, do, 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 YAML file, so when you're deploying a cluster, you're basically specifying what time, uh, GPU sharing strategy that you're using. Uh, here we go. Um, and it's either or. So either you're selecting time sharing or you're selecting MIG. So there, there's a lot of science that goes behind it with like temporal multiplexing, as it's called. You could probably ask the guys at NVIDIA. They would probably know the answer to this. But I don't think you, you can do that. Um, in that case, I would recommend you just use a smaller GPU. The only reason we haven't really played around with multi-instance GPUs is, unfortunately, we deployed our Kubeflow cluster in the Canadian region on GCP. And then like a few months later, we realized the only GPUs we have access to are the the Tesla or NVIDIA T4 GPUs. So, you know, we're in the process of migrating our cluster over to the US region just so we can play around with larger GPUs. But I don't believe it's possible. And generally with MIG, you have to kind of like restart your, your instance to be able to change the configuration of MIG. Okay. Okay, yeah, that, that might actually work. I mean, yeah, I guess it's, it's left up to you to experiment. I could see, like, generally when you do do time slicing, sorry, multi-instance GPUs, you are, like, that GPU slice is treated as its own GPU. So you could probably, like, find out what the underlying Kubernetes command is or manifest is and, and definitely try that out. It, it would be interesting to see. And yeah, it does make sense when, when you're in a student kind of thing where the students are just playing around with notebooks. Again, not when you're fine tuning or training and you need to use 100% of the GPU, but yeah, it might be worth trying that out um, so you can utilize it even more. Yes, yeah. So for our example, of course, we built everything with open source inside our cluster, but uh, Kubeflow allows you to connect. It actually has connectors. Like when you're running a Kubeflow pipeline, um, it has connectors to connect to the cloud service providers. And of course, now that the cloud service providers are all catching on and, and they each are coming out with their own vector search, like every database, it seems, has a vector search. So you can definitely do that. And that's what we recommend to some of our clients because you know, not everybody wants to manage their vector DB. And again, Chroma DB is, is great for small scale, but if you're scaling up to much larger stuff, definitely go with like a managed service or a much more robust uh, database. So yeah, because it's open source, you can swap out and say, I only want to use this. You know, we have clients who maybe just like starting out, they only want to use uh, just Kubeflow notebooks and the case or model serving, and they don't use all the other components. And because the UI is highly customizable, you can actually go into the Kubeflow UI uh, config and just remove, you know, the, the parts that you don't want to use. So you can just have notebooks and just MLflow or something like that. Uh, you mean this? I didn't actually demonstrate a notebook, but which notebook? Uh, so I don't have the actual uh, code for that. I, I don't have it on GitHub. But if you actually go to streamlit.io, um, it. They're, they're really ca trying to cater to generative AI models. So you'll see they have a lot of templates. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah. So they already have a lot of template code on how you can build a chat app. And then the other cool thing is they have like example apps that you can clone directly from GitHub. So if I go to like this Llama chat app, I could totally test it once it loads. But you can also, sh it shows you the, the GitHub repository for that. Oh, wait, it's telling me to install. Uh, but yeah, so you know, all the users who've created their, uh, maybe nothing is working, I don't know. Uh, okay, there it is. There's like, this is a, again, a chat interface, uh, and then you can totally go in and create a uh, fork this app up there at GitHub if you would like. And then the actual retrieval augmented generation part of it is we're just using a basic like Langchain reg. So if you go to Langchain documentation, we're, we're using the same kind of you know calling instantiating the LLM, the the embeddings model, the vector data store, and then just saying run the chain. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? No. Uh, yes. Go ahead.
<laughs> I guess that, that is true of like older versions of Kubeflow in the past. We've even had team members who used Kubeflow in the past, and they were like, uh, I wouldn't recommend when we started out our MLOps platform and I chose to use Kubeflow, they were like, I, I used Kubeflow in the past. It wasn't very good. But now with all the new implementations of Kubeflow, it's getting a lot better. Like with the newer version releases, I showed you how to quickly run uh, Kubeflow. I would I would say that it does take a little bit more advanced if you want to customize it like what we've done. But there are pro there are distributions. I should shout out uh, Deploy KF. The, what, what Deploy KF is trying to do is actually um, solve the problem of how do you customize Kubeflow. Uh, hold on, sorry. Let me just go to Deploy KF. So if you you know don't have a large development or engineering team, you should definitely check out Deploy KF. What Deploy KF basically allows you to do is deploy uh, Kubeflow with uh, very easy customized. Hold on, let me go to the source code. I'll show you. Um, so basically, what you're doing when you go to deploy the, you have one central config file which has all the customization. You just change that config file with your customizations, and then when you go to deploy the cluster, it automatically like but puts the right code in the manifest and deploys. So it's worth checking out uh, Deploy KF. It's a really cool project. But this helps ease the burden. It also helps with upgradability. So when it's time to upgrade to the new release, uh, what Matthew's promising is that you just have to make minimal config changes, and then it'll automatically upgrade to the newest version. So yeah, it's very new, yeah. Yeah, so, so the, the guy who's creating this is actually Matthew Wicks. He's the, he, he's, a big part of the Kubeflow community. He's actually the leader of the notebook division of Kubeflow. Um, so he's working hard along with some others to kind of make it a lot easier for large enterprises to adopt Kubeflow. Cool. Anybody else? No? Yeah, if you want, after, you can always come to me for more questions. Or if you want to see more of the different parts of Kubeflow, I can definitely demo you guys um, all the Kubeflow stuff. Thank you. I guess it's almost time for lunch. So if you guys want to go and grab lunch, you can do that.